Welcome to a special session on art and technology. And because we have four presenters, rather than me making a longer extensive series of comments, we're going to forego that and wait for the end during the Q&A for a more um, engaged conversation. I do would like to hold up into the air as we go into this some brief reflections on art, technology, and religion that bind these disparate presentations together. And that's simply to recall a deep ambivalence in art criticism, art history, art theory around technology. We can evoke figures like Walter Benjamin, the work of art in a mechanical age of reproduction, the loss of aura and the reproducibility that technology enables, but also Heidegger. But there were some presentations this morning in this room that evoked classic Heidegger on, on technology, that the, the virtual simulacra that technology enables is uh, a loss of our authentic, phenomenal connection to the world. And I think all of our presenters today work against that grain in very interesting ways. And we'll be talking about technology and art that doesn't necessarily lead to sort of a solipsistic, uh, individualistic perspective, but explores selves that get entangled with other spaces, other beings, ancestors, trees, strangers. The title of the session draws from Eric Davis's work, Technosis, who's another uh, important interlocutor for ideas in this panel, who has really tried to undo the bifurcation between technology and spirituality, um, to argue that rather than the technological being part of the disenchantment of the world, a la Max Weber, that technology can also lead to gnosis, insight, uh, modes of affect and feeling that are akin to mystical experience. So I'm going to introduce each speaker before they come up to the front. And the order is a little bit different than how it's printed in the program. We're going to start with uh, Emily Pottest, who is a PhD candidate and presidential scholar at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, working at the intersection of art history, media theory, and religious studies. She's also a visual artist, musician, and historian with an interdisciplinary practice that considers the intertwined dynamics of mediated presence, religion, and politics. She's a regular contributor for magazines like The Wire, Art in America. Check her work out. It's great. And the title of their talk today is Living Portals, Technologies of Black Memory in the Work of Christopher Paul Jordan. Thank you, Devin, um, Dr. Zuber. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to present today this work by an artist that uh, I knew when I was living in the Pacific Northwest. He was based in Tacoma. Um, and uh, you know, when I heard the call for what this panel was going to be about, I just thought of his work immediately for reasons that will hopefully become very clear. So the first image that I would like to show you here is a recent work by the artist Christopher Paul Jordan. This was installed at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle in 2002. I'm sorry, 2022. <laughs> Time goes forward. Um, the title of this piece is The Interim, and it is a soundproof recording booth that was installed with instructions indicating that people identifying as black were invited to come into the booth and record their predictions and prophecies for the future, which will be encrypted and stored as a time capsule to be buried on the museum's grounds and recovered 100 years in the future. So in order to fully explore what Jordan is doing with the interim, um, I'm going to go back and provide some background about his work. Uh, Jordan is currently an MFA candidate at Yale University. When I met him, he was living and working in Tacoma, Washington, where he was active as a mural artist, educator, and community organizer. So here he is in his studio in Tacoma in 2017. And here's a photograph of Christopher Paul Jordan painting a mural commissioned by the Seattle Department of Transportation in 2017. And here it is finished. 
And you'll notice this painting uh, features a strange color palette that sort of resembles a film negative. The colors appear strangely until the viewer looks at this through an iPhone camera with the display setting set to invert the color. Um, so, you know, rather than put your phone down and look at the art, this is art that like forces you to look through the phone. And when you do this and look through the technological inversion, the familiar colors of the real world emerge. As Jordan told the online magazine Crosscut in 2017, with phone inversion, you become aware of multiple ways of seeing. It's not about having the right image, but to having the humility to rethink. So I first encountered Jordan's work about a year before this mural went up, and it was under troubling circumstances. His art had just been destroyed by a group of white curators. This was the fall of 2016, so already a very touchy time in political history. I was living in Seattle, and I had been approached to co-curate an exhibition of sound art to be mounted within the context of a multi-venue festival, um, which aimed to situate itself at the intersection of art and technology. Uh, this was called the Black Box Festival. Um, and about a week before the show I worked on was slated to open, an opening night launch party for the festival was held. Um, and this opening night event was organized around the theme of erasure, and it was produced by a group that called itself Art Hack Day, which was based in the Bay Area, I believe. Um, of the 40 artists that it featured, only two of the artists in this exhibition called Erasure were black. These artists were Jaleesa Trapp and Christopher Paul Jordan. Um, both of these artists were best known at the time as members of the Tacoma Action Collective, a group of artists that had recently staged a protest at the Tacoma Art Museum's exhibit, Art Aids America. While more than 40% of the victims of HIV and AIDS in the US have been black, only five of 107 artists included in the blockbuster exhibition Art AIDS America were black, severely undermining this exhibition's ability to speak with or for these communities. Um, and so the Tacoma Action Collective responded to this erasure with a die-in at the museum, demanding a less whitewashed historiography. The collaborative project that Trapp and Jordan had produced for this Art Hack Day event was a direct continuation of this kind of activism. It was about, in their words, the need to refute evidence and artifacts of blackness. A highly technical multimedia installation incorporating two Arduinos, electric controllers often used in interactive artworks, two laptops, a projector, conductive paint, candles, and dozens of printed photographs of loved ones in order to affirm black presence in the gallery space with care, ritual, and remembrance. A few hours before this event was supposed to open, some of the organizers decided they needed to move Chris, Chris and Jaleesa's piece, the piece they had spent hours installing in the space, in the space they had been told was theirs, that they needed to move it. And the artists were not present on site. So instead of attempting to call them or fight, figure out how they could best do this, a group of organizers took it on themselves to move the installation without the artist's permission or input. Uh, they gentrified the art exhibit, they destroyed it, literally resulting in the erasure of a work about the erasure of artifacts of blackness created by the only two black artists in an exhibition titled Erasure. What happened, and here's uh, an image that ran in The Stranger uh, in Seattle of uh, what was left of the piece after it was taken apart. What happened next only made things worse. Word about the destruction of the artwork spread through social media and questions and comments began to fill the public Facebook page for the event. Who had made the call to move the art without speaking to the artists? Um, who made the call that the artwork needed to be moved in the first place? Why hadn't the festival issued an apology to the artists? When these questions were met with hours of silence from the organizers, the frustration in the tone escalated. Behind the scenes, many of the curators who had worked on affiliated events attempted to pressure the festival director to issue a swift, unequivocal apology to the artists affected. When an apology finally came, however, it was more of an exercise in deflection than an expression of empathy. So the rest of the exhibitions that were tied to this festival, including the one I worked on, all sort of dropped out of the festival at that point. Um, and 
This incident drives home a point that has always been present in Jordan's work, which is the politics of representation and how it, it's entangled with the fact that art organizations and the entities that fund them do not always share the values and priorities of the communities in which they exist. Artists are often treated like resources, and artists of color are often tokenized by the entities that love to claim the credibility of being associated with those artists without doing any of the work necessary to actually support those artists and their work. So likewise, I think the technologies that Jordan employs often have their own histories of oppression and suppression, of surveillance, or what he calls algorithmic politics. Rather than rejecting these institutions and technologies outright, however, Jordan instrumentalizes them in ways that deliberately undermine extractive ethics in favor of practices of care and communion. In an artist state, statement for a 2019 residency at the Headland Center for the Arts, Jordan describes his work as, quote, living portals and time capsules for displaced peoples to reintegrate our stories across dimensions. The time capsule is based on a philosophy of latency or a temporal delay employed as a strategic rejoinder to the hegemony of immediacy. As I wrote in a 2017 review of Jordan's work, it is the gap between what something is and what it is to become. The concept of latency first surfaced in this piece, Latent Home Zero, installed at Seattle's Olympic Sculpture Park in 2017. At first glance, this piece resembles a tourist viewfinder, the kind where you pay a quarter just for a glimpse of some distant mountain or a carefully framed monument. Inside the viewfinder are collages that combine photographs of bodies of water that surround Tacoma, Washington, with images inspired by Yoruba ritual. The collages are framed by photographs documenting Jones Glass, one of the oldest remaining black-owned businesses in Tacoma's rapidly gentrifying hilltop neighborhood. In these layered still images, black geographies are suspended in a kind of chirotic temporality, removed from the forces which conspire to erase their presence. I feel like there's this strong high-tech bias to work that's interactive, and I feel like we, need, we go higher than we need to to create certain experiences, Jordan told me in an interview about this piece in 2017. For my generation, he continues, if we see an image, 90% of the time it's a moving image. But when you see a still image frozen in time, it feels more like a memory. In this case, the viewfinder acts like a lens constructed of memories, projecting what is known or believed about the landscape onto how it is seen. It challenges the notion that viewing a landscape is an apolitical or neutral act by foregrounding the construction of perception as a function of memory while reminding us how American landscapes are always haunted by histories of displacement and dispossession. These histories are the starting point for Jordan's work, which uses methods which transcend physicality and immediacy to unite displaced and dispossessed communities across time and space. This constellation of themes, interactivity, latency, memory, and the viewfinder as technical apparatus all resurface in Jordan's work for the 2022 exhibition in the interim Ritual Ground for a Future Black Archive at the Fry Art Museum, Art Museum in Seattle, which includes the piece I showed earlier, the interim, the interactive time capsule, which invites black individuals to, quote, record their predictions and prophecies for the future, storing them as encrypted files, which will be unlocked and retrieved in the year 2123. Jordan conceived of this piece in dialogue with Zora Neale Hurston's Barracoon, based on a series of interviews with the author and that the author and anthropologist conducted in 1927 with Cujo Lewis, the last known survivor of the Middle Passage. This crucial work of historiography was never published during Hurston's lifetime, both because it implicated individuals who had profited off the slave trade and because Hurston refused to let publishers edit Lewis's black vernacular to make it more legible for white audiences. The full text of this completely important historical work, therefore, did not emerge until 91 years later in 2018. Jordan says, in order for something to be prophetic, it must be ahead of its time and also somewhat alienated from its own time. He tells me this over a recent interview conducted over Zoom. 
For Jordan, the latency of Barracoon's publication helps imbue it with the aura of the prophetic, which made the artist wonder what would happen if he solicited stories from his community with the promise that they would not be heard for a century. What kinds of stories might people tell if they knew no one alive would hear them, he asks. What kinds of truths would be disseminated? What kind of perspectives, narratives, and ideas would be shared? What are the stories that capitalism does not allow us to tell? What kinds of stories become possible when we step outside the timeline? Jordan compares our supersaturated environment of information environment with a, with a freeway in which all of the lanes are jammed with traffic. To step outside the timeline is to bypass the traffic jam and its effects on the narratives struggling for dominance in this present moment, resulting in narratives that wind up in the future undaunted by these effects by the time they reach that future audience. There's something about things that go around the timeline, he tells me, things that have these long periods of not being engaged with, not being known, and then are reintroduced and sort of revise and shift our understanding of the past. In his concept overview for the interim, Jordan compares the time capsule with a seed bank, elaborating on the stakes of these stories to time travel elaborating on the stakes of allowing these stories to time travel. Uh, here's the quote. As we witness the exponential escalation of inequality bringing our world to the economic and environmental brink of collapse, I am persuaded that although we may not prevent the end of the world, we can be seed bankers for new beginning. I see black oral tradition as a form of seed banking with the power to germinate additional worlds, regenerative ecosystems, economies, and ecologies of reciprocity and care. There's a profound optimism in the concept of the time capsule in that it assumes there will be future generations around to receive the messages encoded therein. The time capsule also demands a continued engagement with technologies of the present, at least in some form, in order to ensure that the files of the present are legible in the future. Just as the antithesis of extractive ethics are an ethics of care, the antithesis of planned obsolescence is a practice of preservation and maintenance, treating even our tools as treasured collaborators rather than disposable commodities. Installed around the interim at the Fry Museum are a series of paintings of everyday urban environments rendered on boarded, boarded windows. Like the mural I showed earlier, these paintings are designed to be viewed through the camera of the iPhone with its display set to the inverse function. Like the viewfinder of Latent Home Zero, the technological interactivity of these images foregrounds the productive nature of perception, how the construction of our experience relies on the apparatus through which we view the world. The reliance of these images on specific technologies implies one of two outcomes. Either our engagement with these technologies will be extended into the future as a means of viewing them in perpetuity, or at some point these technologies will no longer be available and the paintings will lose a layer of legibility. Either way, the artist has decisively bound the fate of the painting and its reception to the fate of a dated piece of consumer technology with all the future uncertainty that implies. Interlaced among the color inverted paintings are a series of more visually minimal paintings such as Untitled Precipice. The wall text for this painting invites the viewer to touch the painting's surface, undermining the hierarchical distance that typically exists between viewers and artworks in a museum context. Like a shrine that has been touched by every pilgrim who has visited it, Jordan's paintings serve as tangible sites of mediation for trans-temporal community. About a mile north of the Fry Art Museum, in the heart of the historically gay Capitol Hill neighborhood is And I'm Gonna Miss Everybody, a piece by Jordan that was selected to serve as the centerpiece for the AIDS Memorial Pathway. It is built from speakers sourced from LGBTQ venues, which in the artist's words, quote, carry stories as witnesses of our gathering and connections across time. They have witnessed the raves, the house parties, discos, shows, and uprisings that have sustained community in the face of catastrophic loss. These speakers are time capsules holding memories of loved ones no longer with us. Accompanying the sculpture is a series of DJ sets that celebrate the memory of specific loved ones lost to HIV and AIDS. Like the interim, 
and I'm going to miss everybody, is focused on the power of technologically mediated sound to constitute living portals, extending practices of gathering, ritual, and dialogue across geographic and temporal boundaries, including across the boundary of death. The nominally secular space of the museum and the urban neighborhood are transformed through these interventions as they become sacred portals for transdimensional community. The artistic practice of Christopher Paul Jordan asks many questions of vital relevance to this conference. How can the same media technologies which are used to surveil, atomize, and monetize us as capitalist subjects also be used to facilitate what Jordan calls ecologies of reciprocity and care? How may the concept of latency be strategically employed to guide communication over and around rather than through systemic conditions aimed at undermining and suppressing that communication? Through his work, Jordan consistently offers answers to these questions that extend the boundaries of community, helping to ensure that our shared future will be one in which black narratives are transmitted and cherished in the seed banks of the future. Thank you, Emily. We're going to shift computers now. And I will introduce the next speaker as he prepares his computer. I'm looking forward to our dialogue. I think there's a lot of conceptual ideas there about latency, um, time, which thread through the other presentations as well. Lundahl and Seidel are an artist duo based in Stockholm, Sweden. We have with us today only one half of Lundahl and Seidel. On the forefront of integrating VR technologies into various immersive practices, their collaborative work has emerged out of both Christer Lundahl and Martina Seidel's training in modern dance and choreography, as well as the visual arts. Their work has been presented around the world and is held in institutions here and there, including the Royal Academy of Art in London, at the Martin Gropius Bau in Berlin, where they showed in 2016, Kunstmuseum Bonn in Germany, and most recently, they debuted work at the Staatstheater Kassel as part of Documenta 15 in Germany, and were at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology this past fall as visiting artists in, uh, in residence. The title of Christer's talk this afternoon is A Language of What May Not Be Said and Hopefully Soon to Be Seen. Thank you, Devin, for introducing. And also thank you to Arizona State University and the ISS RNC for inviting me and Martina here. Um, so let's see if I can get this right. Is this good? A little closer. A little closer, okay. Like this? Yeah, yeah good. Right. So the image you see is me and Martina being scattered um, among some of our notes. Um, we, um, this presentation is going to be like a presentation of our practice, focusing on 
two of our works and uh, also on the methods that we use to create them. Um, one of these works are actually the work that we're going to show here tonight on the lawn at, outside uh, the old main building. Uh, it's called River Biographies and it was made uh, this year. Um, uh, this, this work is using very analog methods to achieve uh, an experience of virtual reality that is much more immersive in a sense that, uh, ex uh, that existing VR technologies. And it does that by triggering the human ability to organize different multisensory perceptions into a coherent uh, world. Um, and the, the piece proposes uh, that we augment our reality through our relationship with the world. And um, the other piece uses advanced genetic algorithms and VR technologies as explicit mediators of human relations and communication. Um, and throughout the co this presentation, I will call these um, the artworks, but I also, you can also call them uh, stage situations or processes that uh, we devise. Um, so the goggles that you see um, here is uh, something that we call sightless goggles. And, and these goggles um, have been our main tool since 2005 when we started our collaboration. And they are not VR goggles, uh, but it is kind of a proto technology that we use uh, uh, as part of a series of techniques that trigger virtual reality as a projection, more like from an inside out than something that you are looking at. Um, the goggles, uh, in a sense, disrupt the expectations of perception, um, and it, it allows that uh, for f a more common experiences uh, that is not so common within our human umwelt. And, and of course, umwelt is this um, notion that, or like this term that Jakob von Uchtkols, um uh, called uh, the way how organi different organisms um, or, or specify like th that the fact that different organisms have a dif different life world that is very particular for that organism. Um, and so, so with the goggles on, in a sense what you experience is that you see light and shadows more a bit more like a, an early primordial biological eye. Um, but these goggles are not enough to create this uh, virtual experience that I'm talking about. Um, uh, but you have to combine it with um, being moved through um, uh, a spatialized sound that you hear in headphones, um, and that you're at the same time guided through this uh, sound um, th through the uns by the unseen hand uh, of uh, another visitor uh, that you are doing this artwork together with. And in a sense, a virtual space then emerges between you. And um, in the example of the uh, image here, uh, this is the work River Biographies. Um, and here, visitors are moving in pairs, but they also move as a group. Half of them are seeing and half of them are not. And they do not share the same experience. And in fact, of course, we are never doing that because we do experience things from our perspectives. But um, is, and it is precisely because they, um, uh, um, they are dependent on each other's perspectives that they form a co coherent reality within this work. So one of them uh, are embodying the quality of water and the other uh, quali the quality of stone. And together they form a river. Um, uh, but this artwork is also in a sense a, a process of making connection with something that, which is not us, but something that we are a part. Uh, for example, um, it, it traces back the material history of the body. For example, the calcium in our bones that makes us stand upright, uh, it has its origin in exploding calcium-rich uh, supernovas. And I'm going to play um, a video to show what I mean. My body is slowly transforming into Earth. My hand, like a rock. Follow my hand. The rhythm of voices. But like time, a river is neither direction, nor is it living. A polyphony of voices and time.
follow the flow of my hand. We need to follow the water. The stars of the sky, of the lights, following their own stream of time. You carry more. You carry more and more stones, stones and sediments downstream. Do you think you could resist me at the same time as you follow me? Resist my. Yeah. So, in the artwork, um, by allowing visitor autonomy and to involve themselves with the art, we approach the idea of a collectivity, not through a shared vision, but through a polyphony of perspectives, and. As in several of our projects, uh, focus, uh, we're focusing on the notion of the virtual, not as a form of technology, but as the ability to augment our reality through a new relation to our surroundings. Um, and, and the artwork um, re-emerges as a psychosomatic memory after the physical experience. And because it, that's what, um, I mean, what that means is, I guess, um, that the, the work resonates in the visitor's body for maybe days afterwards. Um, and in, in this sense, they are also collectively owning the artwork because they are both created and experienced it. Um, and, and the artworks, um, although they take place in museums and sometimes theaters, biennials and festivals, um, and other physical architecture, the environments that the visitors enter do not seem to exist from an objective perspective, but it exists as relations or intersubjective space. And, but, but even so, they still have a real physical effect on the two bodies that uh, are in contact. Uh, it's a reality shaped by the friction between visual and auditory organs and the nerves of their skin. Um, this image um, is an example of um, how the work also picks up um, uh, influences and contaminates from uh, envi environments that it visits. Uh, here it is at the uh, Arsenal Observatory in Berlin. And it was actually, uh, this place was actually the beginning of the, the work River Biographies. Um, and this location, this, this observatory was also where Einstein for the first time presented the uh, theory of, re of relativity. Um, and, the, and, and, um, and the meteorite in the image is, is quite interesting because, in fact, um, I mean, it hit the, the Earth uh, 50,000 years ago. And the place where it hit down was actually in, here in Arizona. Uh, it, it was uh, Burton Crater, I think it was called. Um, and, and here you see um, visitors holding the, the meteorite. And they are, I think, uh, being becoming aware of that the, the the elements of the meteorite like is high on iron, which is also of course uh, an element which without we humans could not breathe. Um, and um, yeah, in a sense now when we're going to perform this piece tonight, uh, to some in some sense the work sort of goes like a circle in a way. Uh, it comes comes home to Arizona. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, this is another image of that. And here we have, um, it's the recording that we made. Um, let's see if I think we can jump that image. This was, the, in a way, the, the process of, of, of creating river biographies. And we, we recorded the sound um, with a choir. This is the same sound, actually, so we can jump that. Um. Hmm. I'm thinking that I'm in the wrong slide. That's interesting. How is that possible? <laughs> it's um, okay. It's here. I'm gonna do it from. Here is the sound that I'm looking for. This is uh, the sound of stone that we recorded. I'm going to play that. And we're using this binaural microphone 
which is like a dummy head and it records um, yeah s sound in the way how we perceive spatial sound like with the ears you know um, you hearing the delay of sound from one ear to another um, We're going to jump to this. Um, this is the second work that I'm going to talk about. And um, I have, how long do I have? I have a couple of more minutes. That's good. OK. Yeah, so this work is called Garden of Ghost Flowers. And um, so while the first work uh, is very analog uh, to create, in a way, very high tech um, result of a virtual reality, um, the other work here is um, it has a very high tech technology, but um, um, then our methods that we use in a way goes in friction with this high technology, and I think that is what the whole artwork is. Uh, so th this Garden of Ghost Files is proposed a collab collaboration with the public inspired by the experiments and exploration of the 18th century garden. But here in the digital garden, our role as gardeners is reversed and reversed with a flower. And so these two things that inspire the garden's technology is firstly, the sociological concept of resonance defined by sociologist Hartman Rosa as a mode of interacting with the world that is not based on control, but rather an attitude of opening listening which one can be genuinely affected by the other. Secondly, it is a model after the traits of uh, the Monotropa uniflora, common, commonly known as the ghost flower, a plant that abandons photosynthesis and survives in darkness, feeding on the fungal web in the earth's soil. And the ghost flower is also sometimes called a trickster in the ecosystem. Um, so the images you see here is uh, visitors inside the garden, and they have up to 30 connected headsets, um, which allow them to hear, see, and touch the same digital objects within the garden. Um, and as a preparation before they enter, we are asking visitors not to use their uh, voice for one hour, because this the voice that the visitors, um, uh, that the, the voice is their voice and their bodies that they bec uh, become the instruments that produce the source of energy which um, the digital ghost driver lives off. So in a sense, they are um, taking the role of um, uh, the, the mycelium net, uh, network that uh, the biological, biological, biological flower would feed on, and here they are feeding the digital ghost flower. Um, so what rules are at play in this space that we call a garden? Um, so the, inspired by this concept of, of Rosa, we, we, are, you, we are applying this concept of resonance um, as a source of energy, as a listening, caring, and adapting, rather than more like a default uh, capitalist way of uh, commanding, uh, controlling, and um, uh, calculating. Um, so which is default mode of capitalism, maybe not always default mode of technology, but um, so we are thinking about how technology then can, di this new um, sort of ground could be uh, the ground for uh, how we use and uh, relate to technology. So if you are in resonance with someone in the group, uh, you, um, your voice will survive, it will meet another voice and we create some kind of like a, um, a digital object, an, uh, what we call an organism inside this, um, this uh, the garden and um, and um, but if it's not if it's no resonance if there is no listening if, if if everyone is like in the in the group is totally yes not listening to each other or if they are very spread out the, the their voices will just yes, fall down as suit on on the floor not creating any any food for the for the system in a sense um, um, so of course we are not able to create uh, technology that can uh, determine when th people are in resonance. Um, but people, the people that are experiencing the peace, they can feel when they are in resonance. And, and, and um, so what we are now thinking the next step for this project is to, um, um, to make some kind of evaluation and maybe a documentation of what happens in the garden and maybe find almost like a, um, uh, <laughs> Maybe like a Linnean sort of like a, a register for, uh, uh, for resonance. When, but like, what is those states basically, and what is happening to, to try to understand that? Um, so, um, so by posting an artificial life form model of after an endangered flower as an explicit mediator of human relations, who learns and reacts to his visitors, 
The encounter be between the humans in the gardens, biosphere, also involves meeting the modern human in the technology itself. Um, this is a claim, something that we have thought about, and I'm not sure if it's true, but um, I'm going to end, if I have some more time, just to show a little bit how it looks like. Okay. The vibration you feel is the rapid opening and closing of the vocal folds hundreds of times per second. Keep going. Open your eyes and start to let the sound escape your mouth. Call out to the flower. taken back. Do you think it's a tablet? Notice how the tall fish and volume create a diversity of formations. So I think that's it. What you see now is the ghost flower from the outside. When you exit the biosphere, you, you then for the first time can see um, the flower as an entity that, is not, that you're not part of, but you're seeing it from the outside as, an, as, a, as its own entity. Great. Thank you, Krista. from virtual fungal networks that form ghost flowers, we now move to forests. in a very large room. That's the treat. Um, our third speaker today is uh, Sara Dewana Maya, who has maybe traveled the furthest for ISS RNC here, um, along with Christophe. Sara Dewana works, teaches, and researches as a political ecologist and cultural producer at the intersection of urbanism, art, fiction, sustainable development, and conservation. As an independent cultural manager and curator, she's conceived numerous and cultural and educational projects, mostly in the MENA region, South Asia and Europe. And uh, a lot of her current research and uh, curatorial projects are related to the nexus of social ecological systems and regenerative practices, which I think we're going to be hearing about in just a minute. The title of their talk today is Futuring Like Trees, Forest Imagining as Climate Crisis Technology and Art. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Yeah, I'm going to talk about trees and connectivity and art and a whole other bunch of things. Um, the very first thing I want to talk about is the future. 
maybe also the question if there is the future and I can already say no we will see why but um, humanity is obsessed with the future and imagining the future is a very innate human capacity there's a lot of curiosity there's also a lot of uh, fascination and fear a lot of this future imagining or the attempt to find methods to imagine design envision forecast the future with the help of different technologies stems from this need to know and the fear of what might happen wanting to, to be prepared where technology itself is presented as a savior with the assumption that we just need to come up with smarter technology that will save us. Some of these future scenarios are also painting a very bleak outlook on technology. And this morning, one of the sessions, it was said smarter AIs are maybe not saving us, but they are just more closely modeled on white straight men. Here is the so-called cone of plausibility, because what all aspects of future studies have in common is that there is not one inevitable singular future, but instead that there are multiple futures that are possible. And you see here on the left it says present, and then this cone of plausibility says there are different futures. There are possible futures, probable futures, possible futures, and then there's the preferable ones, the preferable ones, the ones that we want. And this cone was developed in early 1990s in the practice of futuring from strategic foresight to speculative fic fiction and art. There are various possible, potential, probable, or even preposterous future scenarios which are pulled from the vast arsenal of potentiality into an imaginary state of being. So futuring usually means imagining the new normal. And possible futures can be tools to better understand the present and to discuss the kind of future or the kind of futures that people want or do not want. And now what do trees, where do trees come into the pictures? What do they have to do with all of this? For once, we do know by now that trees or forests are vital elements for planetary health. We know that a forest creates its own ecosystem when intact that it regulates the weather, stabilizes coastlines, provides habitat, etc., etc. Forests are also major carbon sinks. And healthy ecosystems protect and enhance the quality of life of every entity in that system, including humans. Forests also serve as a safety net for the rural poor, with one in five people depending on them for subsistence and income generation. We also know by now that every year we lose an area that's roughly the size of Panama and that 129 million hectares of forest have been lost since 1990 due to deforestation, according to the FAO. That's the size of South Africa. We also
However, reforestation nowadays, nowadays, it has several, I'm not going too deeply into this, but um, it also relies heavily on technology. Coming back to technology again, the idea of smarter technology saving the planet. So in this case, this is a, a case study from Costa Rica where I worked with an ecosystem restoration project a couple of summers ago that relies on technology like drones for mapping, designing, and monitoring replantation sites. to the changes, which again involves forecasting. But as you can see here, this tool is in a presentation called Optimizing Assisted Gene Flow for Forests, a very technical term. And that, of course, also is not only for creating healthier, beautiful, whatever systems, but to provide ecosystem services. And that is a very problematic terminology because ecosystem services involves that these ecosystems need to be managed in a way. It also means that they serve, that they are there to serve, that they are not an entity in itself, but that they serve someone. And of course, this can often look like this. This is what we in Germany understand as a forest. It's actually a plantation. But for a long time, I thought this is how forests look like. This means that in forestry, Trees are often seen as a commodity. It's a market-oriented field. It's made for timber, which is also why so-called sustainable forest management often says, oh no, of course you need to cut down the trees, otherwise they catch fire. What we see here, on the other hand, is primary forest. On the right slide or on the right hand, you see a so-called mother tree. And that leads us to the fact that reforestation is not necessarily ecosystem restoration. First being often a plantation versus the natural growth of another, ideally, which still cannot replace primary forests. Because we know now also that trees are connected below ground via a vast um, mycorrhizal network, fungi. And the term mother tree has become more known through a woman called Susan Zima, Canadian, who wrote a book, uh, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, and is also one of the characters in Richard Powers' The Overstory, or at least that character is mapped on her. And this, since then, or she has changed forestry in a way because now this mycorrhizal networks have gotten a lot more attention. We know that, for, that trees and forests communicate apart from being know or what gets lost in this conversation is that all of this requires imagination. All this technology somehow forgets about this idea or the fact that to dream a forest back into being, that this ecosystem restoration requires an imagination forward. And it entails the ability to see the tree in the seat and to see future generations and their needs, both human and non-human. And that like for 
in a religion or in a spiritual practice, it requires the ability to believe in something that is not yet there or that is not present in this time-space continuum that we perceive as now. So in short, to grow a forest requires futuring. We also know what you see here is this network of fungi, the underground network. Because Sima did not only rewrite forestry canon, but also our understanding of nature itself. On or operating in the nexus of connectivity, conservation, creation, and care in particular. We know that trees communicate and care for each other. We know that trees share resources. But we also know that trees share more than food. They send messages, warnings, and defensive chemicals to neighbors. They are a large interconnected community that interacts with their own and other species. That means they form mutual aid societies across species. That includes forming kin relationships with their genetic relatives. So mother trees recognize their offspring, their children. And in this train of thought coming to this, this idea of imagination or forest of the imagination, which brings together futuring technology, art, and trees. What you see here is a so-called, it's a, I would say a ghost tree. It's the remainder. It's a straggler, a strangler fig that has, or that is left because its host has died. This is not a reciprocal um, relationship. This is a parasitic rela relationship, clearly. Although sometimes these strangler figs actually help anchor their host trees in storms or floods. But in this case, all that is left is the outer, the, the exoskeleton, so mm -hmm. to say. And coming from this rather unreal looking ghost tree to more imagination when we think of, say, climate fiction, for example, which also imagines realities and futures related to, used to be sci-fi, now cli-fi, a new whole genre by itself, such as the Ministry for the Future, that's one of the most well-known Broken Earth trilogy, but also an older one, the word for world is forest by Ursula K. Le Guin which focuses on a military logging colony set up on a fictional planet inhabited by uh, a native people that lives basically without knowing violence and is only introduced to violence by revolting against their oppressors. Now, for us, this means that um, there is a lot more to discover in this field. For example, here's another rendering of uh, um, what you see on the left, a so-called tree ship, a single enormous tree grown as a spacecraft, which is how people or artists imagine the tree ship from Hyperion in Dan Simmons' um, vast work. That tree ship is built or grown rather by the Templars, Templars as an order that grows and lives in forests. And this is another example, it's called Jungle Memory, created by an AI trained on many thousands of forest images. It's a work by Andreas Greiner, an artist that is intended to document and reimagine forests as endangered life forms, which reinterprets the genre of landscape painting, which traditionally formed our image of nature. But here, artificial intelligence extends the human gaze on nature, questioning the sublime nature experience of the Romantic era. This is another one, which somehow serves as a very dreamy forests like maybe how we imagine if we hear the word jungle or if we hear the word primary forest. There's of course, as I said before, a host of problems with reforestation. Sometimes it's the wrong place, the wrong species, like billion trees initiatives, 
where half of the trees planted die, oftentimes because they're not aligned with the community. Again, connectivity and care that needs to happen for this to be an actual ecosystem that involves all its entities. In the case of Costa Rica, the project, this meant a wildlife corridor, a biological corridor, which involved the communities, the society, the social aspect of conservation, which means that the community also has to have an understanding of the benefits, uh, has to have imagination of a multi-species system in a way, relating to other than human persons, according to Latour or Hallowell or Viveros de Castro or Eduardo Cohn. And I would like to end, because I know I'm out of time, with this one, which is again this cone of um, probability, but adds another layer to it, namely the preposterous, the impossible, the won't ever happen. And the people who came up with this said, maybe this is what we need to look Maybe these preposterous futures that we believe are not possible are the ones that provide solutions, provide different futures from the ones that we can imagine right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sara. Our final presentation this evening comes from Natalia Bell, who I will briefly introduce to um, us to. And I think Natalia, we will connect your computer, right? Unless you want to use, but you had it set up on yours, right? So we can use mine for your script and yours for the AV film stuff. Yeah. Do you, do you want to have um, my computer with notes or? Uh, no, I think I'll just use okay. it all on here. Okay, great. Thank you. Natalia Bell is a Canadian German film artist and writer based in London and California. She completed an MA in experimental film at the Kingston School of Art in 2017 and is currently completing an MA in philosophy at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. So we're a G2 heavy panel tonight. Um, her films have been featured at various festivals and venues, including the Imperial War Museum and the British Film Institute in London. And a lot of her work is very interested in exploring um, the intersection of the sublime and the profane, uh, and how film can become a space for numinous experience in, in Rudolf Otto's sense. Our recent project, Cigarettes, explores the spiritual resonances of smoking, which we are about to hear um, from Natalia about. The title of their presentation this evening is Cigarettes, the Technology and Spirituality of Smoking. Yeah, thank you, Devin, for that introduction. Um, so yeah, now for something a bit different in this yeah, wonderful and eclectic panel. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and yeah, Devin, thank you for inviting me on this uh, for this panel. So like Devin said, I'm Natalia Bell. I'm a film artist who also studies philosophy, and I work primarily with found footage and make film essays that engage with philosophy and theology. So yeah, today I'll be presenting a work in progress, experimental film project that is also developing into a paper. So I'll share some ideas and research behind that. And uh, this project also, yeah, and I'll show some film clips at the end. So yeah, I'm just going to go here. All right. Uh, so Ziggurats is inspired by the scholarship on the aesthetics of breath in cinema. And this uh, project aims to bring the role of breath into the religious, environmental, and technological discourse, and um, yeah, which I hope will be a, 
another um, will enrich in this whole uh, dialogue. Uh, so this project, however, um, confronts a problematic type of breathing that is especially prevalent in cinema, namely smoking. So this film project, Ziggurats, is an overlap of the words cigarette and ziggurat, the Babylonian step pyramid or temple, one of the oldest known religious structures um, in human civilization. So this project reimagines smoking with spiritual resonances through experimental film practice and found footage appropriation. And also informed by theories of breathing as manifesting both immanence and transcendence, I hope to explore uh, spiritual existential phenomenon inherent in the act of smoking as being a type of secular ritual or quasi-devotional practice. A bizarre and absurd phenomenon where we seemingly seem to play with our breath, Western secular culture's closest equivalent seemingly to mindfulness breathing is a type of um, intensified, albeit problematic, form of intense, intentional breathing, a wrestling with one's breath an at an ex existential core that um, suggests it, perhaps a desire to transcend or manifest communion with another, with God, or reflect a divine nature. Right. So, um, yeah, so taking inspiration as the theme of this panel from Eric Davis's Tegnosis, who highlights the, spirit, uh, the overlap of spiritual phenomenon and practice and technology. Uh, this research and film project posits smoking as a precursory technology to all digital virtual reality experiences, the original spiritual tool, one could say. So <laughs> for inducing illumination in religious rituals and alternate realms, especially in Native American rituals, the incineration and inhalation of leaves as a way of playing with one's breath, becoming a technological facilitated spiritual and communal experience and dialogue with the divine. Uh, also the smoke cloud of a cigarette reminded me of the smoke cloud of a temple burnt offering engaging as an effective gesture and offering smoking functions as well as a preliminary uh, technological encounter between fire matter breath and spirit where the cigarette as a medium um, manipulates the material world and the environment namely it's tobacco with fire one of humanity's oldest technologies a problematic Promethean dynamic all reflecting a problematic spiritual legacy of the an Anthropocene. But nevertheless, this Promethean dynamic is what I'm interested in and in wrestling with, and it is what embodies humanity's creative yet destructive impulse. And yeah, and I'm interested in how, yeah, how traditionally, yeah, technology has uh, these utopic visions and these. Um, the trajectory of technology is seen as usually as this myth of progress going from mud to the stars and I find the cigarette a potent image in the sense that it engages with both mud and the stars. It's a symbol, a medium between nature and illumination that creates an existential destabilized space. Uh, so technology, just keep that uh, contrast in mind, technology traditionally associated with progress but in the, with the space of a cigarette and resonating with these virtual spaces that are created with cigarettes, um, I'm interested in the concept of process versus progress. So where breathing is a process, and through film I will explore this. Um, I will continue in this presentation as well by drawing out the spiritual resonances of smoking as a quasi-existential right that can slow down time, and will explore the film, the medium of film as a technology um, that manifests a type of breath, film being a type of breath, that highlighting the aesthetics of breath in cinema and how breathing also reflects the nature of reality as a type of process and how breath itself points to a first divine creative act, drawing on theological concepts in Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Um, so a, a wide range of scope for this talk, so bear with me. Um, so how yeah, and I'm also interested in how smoking reflects as a type of breath, a, rest, a wrestling with one's breath and attention. And um, I'm interested in this concept, actually a biblical notion found in Romans 8 of a groaning of creation and seeing 
nature perhaps and the environment and breath is a type of a groaning and tension and wrestling in that process. So um, I hope all these dynamics will overlap and coalesce. So um, my experimental Sorry, am I on the right slide? Yes. So, my experimental film practice itself involves reappropriating found footage material, where I probe it, um, into, into the layers of everyday phenomenon, often pop culture, present in the film archive material, locating a dialogue of the profane and sub, uh, sublime and how they coexist. And specifically in this project, my practice is unfolding at, yeah, the deeper spiritual resonances I see in smoking. And yeah, a goal of this project is to have a more nuanced understanding of smoking as an embodied, as partly as well as an embodied holistic act, and not merely as just something that can be understood materialistically and reductively as something that can merely be sold with a nicotine patch. I believe there's more going on than the addiction to nicotine, and there's an embodied ritual there that is being performed. and. Yeah, I hope to have more of an, un in, in having a more deeper understanding of this, um, one can understand why humans are causing damage to the world and the environment with these um, excessive acts. Um, so yeah, it'll have a philosophical reflective resonance as well. Um, okay, so yeah, the big pink elephant in the room, yeah, why am I talking about smoking in an environment conference? Yeah. <laughs> And um, so just acknowledge smoking's uh, problematic nature. Um, like I said, yeah, I, I pause it. I'm interested in, um, in ancient religious practices such as sacrifice and the excessiveness of the acts they're in and how they lack utilitarian purpose. So I find smoking actually quite a potent example of this in that smoking parallels literally a literal um, burnt offering in that it takes so much effort to produce cigarettes in themselves and then just to burn them seems an excessive waste or uh, excessive gesture. So cigarettes take an inordinate amount of time to resource produce requiring tobacco en masse to be dried for special curing and heating processes and then after all that work put into making them we simple, simply burn and smoke them. Ima imagine a vast array of products before you that have been produced in a factory then only to light a match, throw it, and incinerate it all, and watch it all go in flames. A startling and dramatic image. That cigarettes are a material object merely assembled for the purpose of burning, like a druid, druid wicker man where so much energy is put into its production just in order to burn it. In cigarettes' case, in the, in, the, a cigarette, um, in the case of a cigarette, it's just for the case of playing with one's breath, an existential curiosity, um, a, hob a hobby almost that involves ruminating and animating our being in our Western secular society and how it's manifested. So burning the environment to simulate an experience. Um, now, again, um, why this focus on smoking? Um, why, how did this, I get interested in this? Um, I, again, aware of their problematic nature, I'm intrigued um, by the set-aside spaces that cigarettes provide for people where it forces them to take a break from their um, everyday business and hustle of industrialized society to just do nothing practical for a moment and sit aside. And as I mentioned before, the smoke cloud um, reminded me of an altar and a smoke cloud offering where I s see the cigarette as functioning as an almost type of prayer, when one, where an altar, where one is, sets aside a time to um, be with oneself and one's thoughts. And, it's, and seeing these resonances of a smoke cloud offering or other religious experiences like lighting incense can function and the smoke cloud going to the sky can have a cathartic element and where one sees our inner world uh, shrouded in smoke and exhaling um, our breath and seeing our self um, in the yeah, shroud of smoke, like a mirror in smoke, functioning as well. It can func function as a witness in a set aside space that ex is, yeah, we can witness an emotion or a moment, a visual referent, um, <laughs> and an anchor to in an intangible um, space. So, yeah, the smoke also can function as a performative and grandiose gesture, a hallowed monstrance to an internal world. Um, and yeah, and I would say there's a connecting to Christer's presentation, just that experience of enjoying to see our um, 
uh, breath shrouded in smoke and interacting with the external spaces and world um, as an essential musing of how, where, how we placed in the world and how my, our breath interacts with it. So, um, yeah, and also I'd say uh, the, the you know, smoke cloud and its performative gesture can act like a, um, a haughty defiance, a performative gesture of defying fate or the forces of you know, having a break from work it can be this haughty defiance of uh, defying the forces of capitalism or industry or just these impressive conditions that only give you such a short time for these breaks. So I, I say this because I'm thinking of John Ber Ber Berger um, in one of his essays on smoke. He criticizes the stigmatization of smoking in our culture and the fact that he highlights the hypocrisy of a society that says you can't individually smoke but uh, industry and uh, cars and agricultural companies, namely forces of techno-futurism, are still held unaccountable and are rampant where we're focusing on, on these ind individual um, experiences of p examples of polluting. So just to add a nuance to um, yeah, these spaces of smoking and how they can um, function and uh, yeah, how they contrast to larger forces. Um, just for the sake of time, uh, yeah, so my project is yeah, counteracting uh, sort of the negative, but I, I still acknowledge in this project the, the negative footprints caused by smoking, of course, but um, try to identify the spiritual dynamics therein and try to point to lighter footprints um, instead of these heavy carbon footprints. I try to point to lighter uh, spiritual and religious practices and alternatives. Um, such as mindful breathing and in offerings of incense in places of worship. So um, as a way to, um, yeah, reconcile what, why as humans we do this by understanding the spiritual resonances in there. And through the film, I try to, um, yeah, I hope they act in rendering these moments spiritual and bringing out their spiritual res resonance. I hope the media can function as a healing element and a type of redemptive act with where the smoking, breath, and matter are in motion with the film edits and the spirit unfolds out, um, out of this motion um, and, yeah, uh, they unfold um, and transfigure and breathe anew with lighter footprints of existential and ecological reverberations. So, um, yeah, I, because of time, I'd say... There would be, um, yeah, I, there's another aspect to my project, again, with this, um, yeah, a, a type of process theology and how um, I see a, a, a parallel to um, a concept where, uh, yeah, I, maybe, okay, I'll do, go to the next slide, and, yeah, so I just want to comment on film generally. Um, so a lot of these films have uh, a footage from film noirs and often these plots are very event driven and narrative driven and I just want to comment on how smoking um, can function as breaks in these moments of narratives, negative spaces that slow down the time of the film and uh, in these moments, in these seedy film noirs, um, there are just these moments where yeah, the cigarettes cast a mystical shroud on a moment and diffuse the space of the film and interrupt the action of the film. And um, yeah, I'm curious as well in how the medium and technology of film as a type of breath and the character's breath coalesce. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm aware it's very at the end of the, the time, so I feel like I'm now I'm shortening things and not making sense. So, Because um, I want to also play a clip of the film, but um, yeah, I'm interested in how the nature of film as a technology can interrogate theories of perception, the nature of reality itself, um, how film has its own type of breath and makes manifest to us breath behind all things. In particular, yeah, the smoke from cigarettes provide um, a visual reference, as I said, to the um, internal world externalized and, and that's why I think they are um, for, you know, used by directors often, and um, and I, yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, um, okay. Um, I'll just say I'll play the film now and just say, yeah, I was also exploring 
um, yeah, breath and the nature of reality as a type of breath and how it reflects a, a Kabbalistic notion of God um, creating the universe and how that was a type of breath as well and that, that'll explain the beginning part of this clip um, so but I don't have enough time to fully explain that so um, but it, it relates to just understanding the process of all reality as a type of breath and tension and type of becoming and working out of um, yeah of um, all material reality and how it yeah, connects with the type of um, process theology and God um, creating reality and allowing there to be an adventure of matter and material reality to unfold and the tensions therein. Um, so I'll just leave it there and just say, yeah, let's, I'll play the clip. And before you do, quick intervention, because we have three audience members who have been stalwart sticking through to the very end. We're going to change the format because uh, Mr. Lundahl is presenting an artwork tonight outside, which some of you might have signed up to experience. We can't go over the time limit. So rather than having any kind of Q&A, there's no space for that, um, approach any of our panelists uh, at the open bar at the hotel where we're having the reception. <laughs> So that's where we can talk over drinks and engage with the presentations. Um, and I think we'll end with Natalia showing her film. I can give you about three or four minutes, yeah. Matt, if that's cool. Uh, and then I have to help Christo Lundahl get set up for the um, immersive art experience outside. So let's give a round of applause to Natalia. Thank you very much. That was, I'm intrigued. I've, I've never seen your film, so I've heard about it for a while. I, I'm very, very right. looking forward to it. It removes itself from a space. Let's see, I'm having brandy. I'll have the same. Brandy, please. Yeah, I'll have a cigarette. deity was all there was, was everywhere, was everything, an infinity, an infinite loop with no beginning or end. How does infinity create a space that is not itself? In order for the eternal to create, it had to make a space that was not itself, a negation separate from itself. Creating an empty space, a contraction, constriction, a symptom. So like an inhalation, it inhales in the center of its being, inhaling inward, contracts, expands creating a void, a negative space, breathe in, breath in, breath in, hold, hold, hold a still and empty space, the still waters of primordial chaos. The eternal, at the center of its being it inhales, in a sense and in a way, it removes itself from a space. Within this negative space, in the very center of this space, center of deity, the eternal then exhales its mighty breath, and the letters of creation blow forth, the breath of God. Onto the waters of chaos, Ruark Elohim, from this infinite point extended, exhale, 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 breathe out, breathe out. Each one of those cigarettes has a story, a conversation someone had, a thought. Something that really happened to a person, he says. They fucking vile, but when I was a kid, I always thought my friend's moms who smoked were so bad that they built them high because they wanted the shrine to be as close to the heavens as possible. Many of the cigarettes have been destroyed over the past several thousand years. The famous huge secret of Babylon was said to have been in ruins by the time Alexander, the Great conquered the city in 330 BC.
you will find that from time to time, your mind will wander off into sounds, emotions or thoughts. If this happens, just acknowledge their presence. Let them be. Let them pass. All women are rivals And gently return to your breath. Give our panel a warm round of applause. Thank you. And uh, if you've signed up for River Biographies, the work from Lundahl and Seidel that's been brought here from Stockholm, that will begin in approximately half an hour outside by the fountain. We will assemble on the steps.